Welcome, everybody. We are on. Also, thank you to all our friends who gathered together to celebrate Bob's work and Dr. Thompson's work. This play is because we're going to try and keep it really informed. I just want to mention that we just got a notice from um, one of the great dancers from Brazil, Isawa Oliveira, who said, I stay to the project. I stay to what we're doing today. So, but um, it's funny how I met Bob, because I, I met him in the same week. Two different people, two friends told me I need to meet this guy. One was um, uh, Warrington Hudson from the Black Filmmakers Foundation. He's a Hollywood filmmaker and, and a good friend. We were talking one day about his film. And I said something about how black speech sounds like haiku. He said, well, you need to meet my teacher from Yale. I said, what's his name? He said, Robert Clarence Thompson. The same week I was visiting a Mary Baraka in Newark. And we talked about something and he said, you need to meet this guy I co taught with at Yale. So I said, now this is crazy. In the same week that two people I know and really respect tell me I need to meet him, so I have one to take me up to meet him. 
So that's how we met. I went up to Yale with Warrington and we had a chance to talk and hang out. And he it's just really funny because with Bob, we don't just hang out. Because we came in and he invited to your class, and all of a sudden you were in the class. So we started taking people up to the class and they were given assignments. You know, the teacher, you know, Paleros and Santeros from New York coming and hanging out and they're giving classroom assignments. The next time there's something like you have to come in and you have to do the speech that's in present. You know, so I mean that, that is, in the spirit of that is how we, we want to conduct the season too. But it's Robert Ferris Thompson. He was born in 1932 in El Paso, Texas. Dr. Thompson is one of the foremost scholars of African art, religion, and philosophy, and their influence in the America. His numerous books include Black Gods and Kings, Yorba Art at UCLA, African Art in Motion, Icon and Act in the Collection of Catherine uh, Corian White, African Art and Motion, Art Illustrated Guide to the Exhibition, The Four Moments of the Sun, Congo Arts in Two Worlds, Flash of the Spirit, um, uh, African and Afro-American Art and Philosophy. And I want to say something about Flash of the Spirit quickly. Flash of the Spirit was so popular that it made him unpopular in academia. So people were really mad. Why would this book be uh, found in all the major bookstores, but found in all the major botanicals? You know, the, that, the, the scholars were some kind of sacrilege that the people actually liked his book. They couldn't be scholarly, but they were scholarly and they were written for everybody who read these things. Uh, from a few other books, he did a book on teaching, Place of the Gods, Art and Authors of Africa and the African Americans, which was also an exhibit, and Tango, the Art History of Love. I also want to mention that his final book, Mambo, or his last book, the latest book, Mambo, is basically completed. We haven't figured out how to have it published yet or, or who will we, publish it to. But he was um, the Colonel John Trumbull Professor of Art at Yale University, he served as Master of Trinity Dwight College since 1978. He was the longest serving Master of a residential college at Yale. He was also, he was also considered by many, especially in this town, as the United States' most prominent scholar of African art. He presided over numerous exhibits and exhibitions. He did five of those exhibits for Martha and myself at, at um, the Caribbean Culture Center. So, and in 1966, he, he not only is a scholar, he is a devotee. He's a, he's a practitioner. In 1966, uh, Thompson was initiated to the Alicia every lay in Agbado Yoruba tradition by a priestess and master called Sotri, Abakan Odefunke Ayeinke, Iya in OYK Odan, Nigeria. In 1972, in the village of Defang in Baliang territory, Cameroon, he was initiated into Ekwe, Leper Society, which was, which was the birth of Abakwa in Chile, the same society. And by Defang elders, initiated to the highest level of Bastinjan, an anti witchcraft society by Chief Defang. And also, and in 1988, he was initiated to the Prender in Sisisara Banda, in the tradition of Parlamonte Porta Lima, by Paji and Ganga Alberto in Zagada, Herzlana, Chile. So he's a, he is, he is a, a scholar and a practitioner and an appreciator. So, I mean, it's incredible just to be able to celebrate him while he can understand that we're celebrating. I mean, and we're happy to have that opportunity to, to, to do that too. As, as we said before, we've gathered some of his friends to talk about him and to talk about the work he's done and how they've been, been influenced by his work. Too. We'd like to begin with a distinct, in fact, on my introduction, we're going to be incredibly brief because you can find all the all this information, the biographical information on the website. So the one would be uh, Dr. Willem Abiyadun from Amherst and Dr. Abi Adun is one of the foremost scholars of Yoruba tradition, being a Yoruba himself. That's, that's, that's funny, but that's one of the things that we learned from Bob Thompson. It seems so simple right now, but up until some of the work, nobody thought that. If you want to know something about Yoruba art, art ask the Yoruba. You don't have to invent something. You can ask the Yoruba. They will tell you what they're doing, you know, and they know what they're doing. So, I mean, that's one of the things that Bob made clear in a world that didn't want to hear that, a world that wanted to tell the Yoruba what they were doing. So, again, Dr. Roland Abi Adun. Uh, Roland, I think you have, to, you have to unmute. Ronnie. Roland, you have to unmute your microphone. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll try and uh, rush through this like uh, catching a train. Well, in this generation of um, a botanic art historian, um, Robert Ferris Thompson has made the most radical and most important shift in the study of indigenous art forms and aesthetics from the user's uh, point of view. Uh, that he has imbued his scholarship and the teaching of African art and Afro-American art with the Yoruba derived concept of Ache, which literally means the, uh, the empowered word must come to pass. It's highly commendable. Uh, etymologically, um, uh, the Yoruba word Ache 
is a noun formed by adding a the, uh, to the predicate, she, come to pass, which is a normal nominalization process of turning a verb into a noun in your language. Now, utterances, pronouncement, voicing, uh, voicing of blessings or curses, and the power of spoken words is central to the still ever evolving study of the phenomenon of Ashe, effective energy and life force, often associated with the vocal, with the visual performing arts uh, of the Yoruba and their descendants in, uh, uh, in the diaspora. So well, it, uh, I'd like to give a brief note on Ashe, and especially its entry into African American and diasporic art studies. Attention to form and uh, inattention to content has characterized the approach of many scholars of 20th century art to African art. For most, form alone has been the defining aesthetic factor. They have demonstrated very little or no interest in understanding African art in their context. So the, the, the common practice, as you all know, reached the fullest uh, expression in an exhibition at New York the Museum of Modern Art, Primitivism in 20th century in 1984. In my own research, which spans over five decades, I have had occasion to address some of the same aesthetic and uh, the methodological issues pertaining to our chair. I will sum, I will sum it up in the, the Yoruba proverb, uh, what follows six is more than seven. This proverb uh, suggests that we look beyond what is simply uh, culturally observed in order to be able to understand uh, Yoruba art, or indeed any African art. In other words, we should not be content with it only a formalistic analysis of Yoruba art, but endeavor to understand it as the expression of the thought and belief system that produced it, lest we unwittingly remove the African from African art. Among the Yoruba, uh, among the Yoruba sculpture, shrine painting, ritual, objects, food, and other sacrificial items, their arrangements, architectural space, uh, designs, colors, uh, odors, scents, where they occur, and all essential components of poetry uh, for which the visual material is a vector. Now, when activated, um, Ashe can evoke the power, the presence of the original, human, animal, virtually everything that is where, for example, many art historians encountering a Yoruba Shango shrine for the first time might be impressed by the collection of uh, printed sculptures with a balanced uh, and sophisticated uh, distribution of uh, deep blue, red, uh, dark green, Caroline white, pink, lemon yellow, uh, or kind of against the white background, uh, which could be considered really a feast, a visual feast for the user for the people who use it and the makers who are Shango devotees and priests. An affected uh, aesthetic uh, experience will just be beginning. More importantly, for a devotee, such an arresting uh, visual experience has to be empowered by verbal and performed origin. They are colorful, impressive costumes. They are ear-piercing bata music, perfectly choreographed dance movements peculiar to Shango uh, performances, peace, order that would imbue such a shrine with an Ashe charged energy, um, raising it to a new level of shared uh, 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 aesthetic experience beyond the ordinary. So this scenario may not be familiar for the normative uh, Western aesthetic sensibility. If, uh, if what Robert Ferris Thompson has attempted to introduce into his scholarship and classroom. The simultaneous interplay of all these uh, forms of Odyssey does not lend itself to uh, easy description, translation, and analysis, especially if we rely solely on the terminology and theoretical uh, construct of Western academic disciplines like art history. Um, the methodological challenges, however, uh, created opportunities to teach new and contextually uh, relevant the theoretical alternatives based on the African uh, uh, concepts like the Yoruba, Asher, and the 
process of hardship has intrigued many people, many scholars, both in Africa and the diaspora, especially in robot terrorism. Still retaining more or less its original meaning among the um, African and people of African descent, Asia remains uh, foundational in uh, uh, religio aesthetic and artistic history in Brazil, in the Caribbean, and also the United States. As I said, using, uh, is used in Brazil to define the Tandonga, which is uh, the houses of water, otherwise called the Ilea Shell. And research confirms that in Cuba, the sacred uh, world of the Santeria is motivated by Asia. In the United States, African American culture, the Asia concept is more interesting than existing. And practically felt in African American church, the spirit, the Holy Ghost, or simply power embodies an Asia type phenomenon. And quite often, a church minister or person who manifests this spirit or power is highly regarded in the community and seen as one with distinctive aura. And in more secular contexts and in, in literary oral tradition, such as signifying plagiarism, uh, dissing, snapping, rapping, sitting, there are similar striking similarities and in perhaps uh, even reverberations of the structure and uh, uh, affecting uh, aspects of our share in building the group. From these very general uh, observations regarding the very use of our share to describe sacred places, modes of worship, and frequently works of art, whether visual or performed in Africa and the New World, it is clear that our share is the most important religious aesthetic concept to have survived transatlantic slavery, nearly intact almost 100%. Indeed, a careful examination of the Yoruba concept of Asia, especially within the context of tradition, is necessary to understand the transatlantic manifestation. Among the Yoruba, depending on the context, the word Asia is variously translated and understood as power, as authority, as command, as scepter, as a vital force in all living and non-living things. It's coming to pass upon utterance or in video Christian terms, may be close to, but not the same thing as the Logos proposal. So uh, uh, devotees of the Orisha, the concept of Asia is more practical and immediate. Asia in habit energizes the awe-inspiring spirit of the Orisha, their authors, their objects, the senses, often, including even the air around them. They are the contribute to and share in the power of the sacred location and the architectural space where um, priests and devotees may be recharged with a share before that is in any significant time. So ritual performances for Orisha constitute occasions for priests who are also artists recharge their a share. Though this is not unusual for some old priests, for example, at their festivals, to respond to their Orisha's highly affected music and religion, will their a share perform the highly energetic dance and the magical uh, feet, which are vocal uh, citations characteristically from those others who so invoke his action. For example, uh, in Beji, uh, Shango's offspring is called a child guided by a strong god. And this strong god, you, you know who he is. He dances to midnight yesterday, dances till midnight today, dances till midnight tomorrow. Orisha Ibeji shares what Shango's music, whose the ear piercing battered drum, is, is capable of inducing dancers into a state of protection. Thus, Robert Perry Thompson could not have been more correct in calling Ibeji the sons of thunder. So, to understand how Asia works, we need to be familiar with the, with the term, yes, which is to answer, chef to become effective or become manifest, and quick to summon all of whose meaning illuminate the effectuation of power. And we consider this in the following uh, divination verse. The day if we curse what birth was the day that I shared last year came to existence. Likewise, only was born on the day if it was invoked, I share what asserted, if it was summoned. But they still need own, they still need speech to activate them. Without speech, without voice, without the performed word, neither is it, nor the malevolent uh, uh, component of life, nor a share. 
the largely benefit, beneficial uh, uh, component of life for two sides of the same um, and to build their now, to get and to down have important aesthetic implications in your work, especially on, under the aesthetic canon of Illuti. Illuti literally means good hearing, which determines whether or not the work of art is alive. And response, and that is get or down. Briefly put, Illuti is a, a, a foremost criterion in determining if a work of art fulfills its uh, its inherent intention of the statistic expression promptly and with precision. Black churches in the United States, as God is able, that the like uh, uh, phenomenon is still very much alive in what has been generally called the call and response mode of worship. And in West Africa, Yoruba look for an orisha with the looking to worship, as evident in the saying, we worship and celebrate only deities who can respond when called upon. In summary, the, it is, I share it in religious aesthetic essence in which physical materials, uh, at visual origins and verbal origins support and empower each other to activate, actualize, direct social, uh, political, religious, artistic processes and experiences. I share it fundamentally, also fundamentally informed not only your body, but also that of their descendants. I say it's affected. It triggers uh, uh, a powerful response, even when it's working to not be fully and immediately uh, comprehended. A Google performance, subject, costume, with their attachment of medicinal gold, handheld form with organ, odor, oral performances, music, dance, movement, touch, in food. Or all embodying origin, which can and often do induce sound, space, matter with action, the energy which destructive existence, transform and control the physical and metaphysical world. This is what Robert uh, something has brought to our uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Abiyadu. Dr. Abiyadu, could you say that there's one problem you mentioned um, that um, after six is more than seven? Yes. Thank you. It's always so beautiful to hear it in, in, in the whole language. You know. yes. But we, we're going we're to ask you to speak again about some of your ideas you had about continuing the legacy of Dr. Thompson. So the, the next presenter will be uh, Mayor Santos Sebi, who we're happy to have, who's overcoming sickness to be here with us. Yes, I will be very brief. Um, this, this coming back to some pandemic has been very weird, but at the same time, very fruitful. Um, I have not had the honor of knowing, uh, of meeting uh, Robert uh, Ferris Thompson in person, although I have, I have read most of his work. One of them, the seminal work, which is The Flash of the Spirit, has helped me understood and understand and change the poetic spirit. I write literature, but I don't only write literature. This is something that I understood very clearly after reading The Flash of the Spirit. Um, I was always uh, oh, very confused of the fact that I could write all these, that I could write poetry and at the same time essays and at the same time uh, short stories in front of this, and always in tension and contention with the Western tradition was that I was brought up with as a Puerto Rican uh, black woman, an Afro descendant that wanted to, to talk and to sit down and, and discuss uh, what could be an Afro Caribbean and Afro diasporic Latin American aesthetic. So for the longest time, I'm only 50 something, so I started at 19, don't ask me why. For the longest time, I was always at, at odds with the classifications of literature that I was writing. Um, I've been labeled as a, an erotic writer because always the body was in the center of whatever I wrote, and also as um, a folkloric writer, which I'm not, and also as a trans, a, 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 a transversal writer. 
speaking with Adamant and writing in most genres. But when I read the flash of the spirit, I understood that it was not true. And so trying to manifest itself in the most precise and, and, and uh, experiential uh, a situation in which you could write the words that were not only yours, that were yours in terms of the possibilities of you as channeling those words, but also that were the words of my ancestors and my community. Um, there was one particular writing, one particular novel, that was uh, uh, the importance of Robert Ferris Thompson's work was um, a fundamental for my writing. Uh, actually, uh, two concepts of Robert Ferris Thompson. One of that, one of them is the aesthetics of food. The aesthetics of food was. Uh, for me, I love the opening in understanding uh, the importance of water and rivers in many of the literature in Puerto Rico, especially the writings of Julia de Burgos that defines herself against Rio Grande de Loiza, which is the bigger, biggest river of Puerto Rico. But also, and this I have to say, she died of, um, of drinking too much of alcoholism, which is the aguardiente, you know? And when I was understanding the um, aesthetics of the pool and water and the way with water, connects with creativity, connects with cleansing, connects with also a, a movement. Uh, I understood better the literature that Julia de Burgos that defines herself as an afro descendant in the 1930s actually the first Puerto Rican that does that, a woman, the first Puerto Rican woman that does that, it was incredible to me. I could read my literature in a different way. But not only that, I could also read Virginia Herrera in Cuba. I could read Virginia Brindis de Salas in Uruguay. I could read Josefina Baez in the Dominican Republic and Cayetani and Cuba. I could read um, literature that was that was taught to me that I was only reading from the West and I was in a different way. And also interact with that literature in a different way. Uh, another one of the most important uh, concepts that led me to a three a hundred and eighty degree change in the way in which I a, a approach this practice of writing. It became a practice of writing. Oh, sorry, I must say, um, I am an author. So, yo soy una de Entonces, to have that revealed to me, uh, what I had in, in my spiritual practice, bring it to understand that I cannot divorce it from the ways in which I work literature was very thin and very liberating. And um, there was there is a work that is really important and based on uh, Robert Ferris Thompson. I just want to thank him uh, from the bottom of my heart and even though I am <laughs> not feeling very well, I decided that I have to be here uh, and, and, and do this because this is important. And one of the the, the the novels that I wrote, Lamante de Gardel, the uh, Gardel's Lover, is based, is based on the uh, uh, research of Robert Harris Thompson's book, Tango, in which I all of a sudden, you know, found out that there was a complete uh, way of situating and defining Latin America and the Caribbean from an Afrocentric perspective. After I read Tango, I started understanding, deeply understanding in an aesthetic way, from an aesthetic position, what is Afro diasporic and what is an Afro diasporic aesthetic. Because you could see that in Argentina, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Esmeraldas, in Panama, in Colombia, in the diaspora of US Afro Latinos, 
in African Americans and in the, in the rest of the Caribbean, Cuba, Puerto Rico, La República Dominicana, the aesthetic was the place. It was part of the emotional scholarship and the emotional uh, education of most Latin America. Tango is not thought of as a African based um, a expression, musical expression, yet uh, Gardel was the architect and the archetype of Latin American modern masculinity, um, and uh, one of them. And so it's really important to see, uh, and the way in which Robert Parley Thompson repositioned uh, in a very respectful and profound way. Um, uh, the, the aesthetic of who the aesthetic of Afrocentric centered uh, expression. By the understanding of Ache as the force that makes everything manifested in this plane of reality, then also it opens a way in which a lot of Latin American and Afro Latin American and Caribbean writers can explore beyond the constraints of what Western culture has defined as the vanguards, you know, as vanguardista. That experimental movement it, it opens up, you know, the, the way in which Western a, a world defines vanguard art a, when connected to these definitions and this research that Robert Travis Johnson has done, creates something that I, I, I don't know, and this is the way in which I want to come to, to, to finish, you know? I think it's an Afro-futurist invitation to a continue writing work that is a every day more um, decolonial and also more um, intention with the definition of art as production and objectification of peace uh, versus the, the practice of peace. In these moments in which in all Latin America and the Caribbean there is an upheaval and a redefinition of what is identity, what is Latin American identity, what is faith, racial democracy that has been central to the definition of nations in America and Latin America, Robert Paris Thompson is una piedra de coco. It's a place to go and touch and start redefining and looking at this thing that I call fractal Afro-diasporic identity, the ways in which our identities of Latinos, our identities of Caribbeans, our identities of Caribbeans, our identity as Afro Latin American, Latin Americanos is all one, but like that, you know, a different practice. And, and, and the ways in which we potentiate the uh, herencia, the, 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 what, ha, what we have received from our uh, ancestors and projected into a future that is even more and more and more and more amplified. It is universal in a different way. So um, this is um, what I want to say about the importance of global terrorism in Latin America, in the Caribbean, and, and how incredibly uh, grateful we are for the study of this work and the detailed expression of fundamental a concept that uh, uh, created and explained laughter by Thank you, thank you. That's incredibly poetic insight into the influence of Bob's work, of Bob Thompson's work. I'm really glad you decided to overcome your throat problems, which we didn't have to hear at all, which we didn't notice at all. Too. But, 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 but for, for those looking, look behind me, you see a picture of Bob Thompson with, I got to duck my head down, with Alex Desai and his group Alma Moyo. Alma, uh, uh, Alex and Alma Moyo were a house band for Timothy Dwight College at Yale University. But if you look at Bob, you can see that he's soaking wet from dancing to the music that they produced that night. So he was not a, um, 
different scholar. He was an involved scholar, a participatory scholar too. So it'd be just incredible to watch that go on too. But um, also, I, I just want because of, we're celebrating Puerto Rico at the minute. I just want to mention I was walking down the street in Puerto Rico with Bob Thompson, with Alice Asai, with Fukia, and that one of the famous colonies, uh, Congolese scholars, uh, Fukia, and with um, um, uh, Obeni Adu uh, Allende, uh, who's a drummer, and his father. And then Obeni's father is, is a great uh, drummer in Puerto Rico. Also, he turned around and looked at Bob and said, "I know you." The Palladium. And he just he just remembered him at the moment as we're walking down the street. It was just incredible to realize that such is still there. And you're talking his, his, he was responsible 50 years ago for another kind of consciousness. But we'd like to move on to our next uh, presenter. presenter would be uh, Dr. Barbara Martinez Luis, who has uh, published a, a, one of the finest books on the Congo tradition called Congo Graphic Writing um, and Other Narratives of the, uh, Other Narratives of the Science. Uh, uh, Dr. Martinez Luis, could you please address us? No? Hey. Hey, hey. Um, I, I, I wrote a, a 12 page of paper to talk about my... No, do, do three pages. Do three no, no, I, I, I think I, I know very good in following the, the, I think it's better for me to kind of evoke the spirit from uh, Roland's um, and the fluidity of his uh, presentation. But uh, I, I think it's uh, very difficult for me to kind of go straight to the, the question being placed by, by Roland's uh, radical act from, from Robert Hart Johnson from Mass and Peace. Uh, why why is important? Why we need to remember? I think that was the, something he said uh, at the beginning, and I think it's uh, sometimes what we are forgetting is how important it is for the discipline of art history or for academia. I think we we all being touched by his incredible generosity and gift and his uh, mind, but sometimes we forget the struggles and the difficulties try to push forward his own um, understandings uh, of our history and the changes that have to be um, put in place in order to um, decolonize, I think it's very much as that would be the, the words we're using right now, the idea of decolonizing the discipline, decolonizing uh, Western thinking. I think that, uh, but before, you know, before I go into what that means, uh, I, I, for me, I cannot disconnect uh, Robert Fire Sample and Master P from Danny Dawson. I mean, it's the, I knew him through Danny, and Danny, I think, is the person who connects everyone here today. I think it's, that would be fair to say, it's also this day, it's not just for Robert Fire Sample, it's for Danny, in my. Um, and Martha, don't leave Martha yeah. um, um, But the, going back to this, why is so important? In, we're kind of forgetting that 1960s, 1965, 1967, when uh, Master P was in a in a very conventional art history department, in which didn't have a space for understanding the emerging of a new area of inquiry by African arts and African diaspora. In the the fact he was kind of forced to to teach about all the traditional historical um, um, art forms. And our history was a kind of in the backdrop of the department and the interest in the department. And uh, what he decided from that moment is to create a new kind of cartography, a new kind of way to realign and reshape the way his colleagues are thinking um, and how to integrate him in the, in the large scheme of the discipline of our history. And in a way, it was kind of like a Try to domesticate him and him to try to change the discipline. I think this kind of that kind of tension emerged from that from that moment. But also something that, that would be important to remember at that time when Master T tried to force the a new and give a shape to the, uh, a new field of, within the discipline of art history it was another person, Roy Seaver, back in Indiana, also who tried to do exactly a similar thing. I mean, we cannot. Uh, it would be important to understand uh, Robert Fire Thompson in the context of the emerging new uh, push to change the, the discipline of art history. I think that that, um, that that would be important. But the, 
one of the questions that been from from early work from from RCT was is a need to understand the social conditions of African African culture, the social position of African um, artistic sensibility. We couldn't three you know kind of refocus the interest of uh, um, African art just in issues of aesthetic or styles or issues of representation that was the main common thing in in art history as a discipline you can kind of decide kind of to propose a new way of thinking about what are uh, um, what are the principles of this new field that in art history we call epistemology and he didn't like he hates those, what he calls fancy words, 500. And he used to have like a, a amount of numbers allocated to important you know, important words used by scholar at the time. Epistemology uh, was one of the most expensive according to Master T. But the, in a way, kind of the, the, the desire to not just to challenge the way uh, uh, the conceptual framework of a discipline that didn't fit in, didn't respond, because I have an over focus in issues of styles of representations and couldn't understand the dynamic nature and the multi um, um, uh, media conditions of the artistic practice in Africa and African diaspora. And it forced him to kind of um, outline his own methodology for his own writing. And I think it's the way I see his work is each of the books they make in a specific observations about the way we saw we should understand um, African art and African diaspora. The number two, I think he make a case for African cannot be disconnected from the rest of the world. And Africa also an African diaspora that had to be in a similar, in the same argument. Um, and I think it is this idea of a radical artist not just to propose is what he the term he used for many, many years, the African civilization, that was very popular in his lectures and in also through his book. It was more about trying to understand how this knowledge uh, transcends the stereotype and the simplicity and the limitation of, of, of Western of Western discipline and try to bring what he called the African voice into, into the forefront of the argument. And, and going back to a comment that Danny said about if you wanted to know about Yoruba art, you should ask the Yoruba people. If you want to know about Congo art, you should ask a, 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 a Bakongo person. But the, the, the second part uh, that I want to kind of focus now is also go back to kind of respond to uh, Roland and have to do uh, how, how I view his scholarship and his incredible generosity into my own, into my own work. I think it's the uh, Roland outlines an important um, um, principle in understanding not just the Ruba culture, also the Ruba worldview and, and the Ruba artistic practice and sensibility. Also, Thompson was very um, um, clear in trying to find those principles that are unique, specific of a particular cultural tradition. And I think it's, that is something that uh, most of the scholars try to generalize about Cuba, also about, about Africa as a general thing, and Thompson insists that have, we have to be specific. The idea of specificity in African study was uh, critical in, his, in, his, in, in the way he was writing a specific scholarship in a specific moment, a key moment in time. And I think we can see the entire scholarship like providing a, a kind of mosaic of that was Previously presented as the African civilization later became um, um, classical African traditions, historical traditions in, in both sides of the Atlantic. But the, well, one of the, 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 the first things I remember when I, I went to study with him was the, the need to, he, he thought it was a, the understanding African art is, is almost like an everlasting project that never ends. And he asked me a particular question is, what exactly, what is your view of African art? What is your contribution? That, uh, that I think I wasn't in the position to think about my contribution in the field. I don't think I, um, I, it was something that you know, come to, to my mind. But 
the, the, we kind of insist all the time to think about what is the, the specific framework, conceptual framework that you can use to explain Congo 3 and the Congo 3 and you come from. And it kind of insist in finding very specific uh, um, um, traits that will outline my, my, my proposition. And one of the, the, the legacy is a uh, um, um, challenge it was about thinking of mode of communication that you know we kind of created a, a kind of holding type of name for that what we call graphic writing system that used to be a particular way of thinking about um, communicating to with signs and symbols that you know, study different graphic tradition in all over the world but we wanted to kind of focus in the idea of a graphic writing tradition in the context of the um, um, the African diaspora. And, and kind of my question kind of starts from try to not just to uh, um, to try to to do a glossary of training. Uh, he was insisting in understanding the mechanism of writing and how how we create meaning and how we communicate and how specific those particular um, um, tropes are specific of the Congo tradition versus the uh, Yoruba or Mande or other um, traditions. And the last uh, point I wanted to make is about uh, kind of comparison of what Ashe mean for Yoruba culture. That Master T recognized the importance of Sindhi in Congo culture. And, um, and he tried to kind of propose a new way to understanding how uh, the religion is organized and what is the role that Sindhi as a concept plays in the formation of the cultural practices. And I think that that, I think is the, for me, is the, the, the most important contribution uh, from Thompson in understanding and study of Congo art to define um, the role of Sindhi in relation to an ecosystem of uh, concepts that, that as a whole can be used to explain the nature and the principle of the, of the Congo culture. Thank you. Barbara, before, before you go, could you tell them that, how you came across uh, Thompson's work when you were still in Cuba? Because you told me the story about some of uh, sharing, kind of sharing. The, the, uh, I was studying, when I was studying at Havana University, uh, I was interested in uh, study graphic, uh, the stigma, the graphic writing system of a Congo based religion in Cuba. And uh, my, my advisor at the time, uh, her name is Yolanda Wood, um, told me, uh, oh, there is a uh, communication of this famous professor. There's a chapter from his book, Casa uh, of America, the American House, um, of his book, uh, Flash of the Spirit. And I, I kind of went down to kind of get a copy of the chapter for, uh, uh, and pretty much kind of helped me to shape my entire, you know, this thesis at the time, uh, and being you know, a key um, text in my future development of the uh, So Well, Tony, they didn't bother to tell you what the book was, too, until much later. You have to find out on your own. It's like a secret document that we're going to be partial out a little bit, too. But also, I just want to mention before we leave you that um, I, I remember when we went up to visit Bob, and I, Barbara came to, and sat in on a uh, seminar. And he was sitting there and everybody was talking and talking. And finally, at the end of the seminar, he, he asked um, Barbara, do you have anything to say? And Barbara spoke. And after that, Bob walked over and said, what do you do? He said, oh, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an artist and I'm an artist, so I'm not doing this. He said, um, uh, uh, are you interested in going to school? He said, yeah. He said, well, would you like to come and get a doctorate under me? You know, so I mean, it, it's just, it was just that simple, that crazy, that just sitting there in a, in, a, in a classroom and contributing and Bob recognizing the talent and asking him if you want to, if you want a doctor, I'm about to give you, you know, so he said, I mean, it's just incredible when you talk about general. Again, thank you, Barbara. For, for uh, uh, hold up a bit, because I think it's important to understand that um, Thompson was also doing this work early in the 50s in Mexico, yeah. right? Being, uh, being the return of Cuba, Perez Prado to Mambo, Right? And then when he uh, focuses on New York, we have to mention Julito Coyasso, mm -hmm. master drummer, the master of that drummer, right? Because he was Thompson's informant as well, right? 
And this is important to uh, discuss because he was deep into the tradition in New York City with the Afro-Cuban community. And one of the people that was instrumental in him getting into Viva was Julito Collazo. And Julito Collazo, right, from, from Cuba. Brought, also the, one, the one who introduced Bata drumming to the United States. Yeah, him and Francisco Abarella, right? Mm -hmm. So that what you see is also the connection of Thompson to Catherine Dunn and to Pearl Primus. was on the ground consistently within community and the palladium was key to it because when um he starts uh sort of maybe to point there to eddie palmeri and all of these artists it's also looking at that history that they bring and yeah, the palladium also plunked him out of law school you know and made him decide he didn't want to do that he decided he'd go back into art history because he's in law school and he would go to the palladium and he ended up failing in law school, so he decided to, to go somewhere else and to do what he really wanted to do, which was do with that African country. But again, Amartya, you bring up a real good point too. One of the things we learned from him is that in your studies, you pursue what you love. Because he said he was he was in Mexico with something, and he heard this music he had never heard before, and it turned out to be Mambo. And it, and it changed his life. It became, he, he decided he didn't know what it was, but that was going to be the rest of his life. You know? And also, I, I just wanted to add, there is a photo from 1963 in our spring break that comes from when it was his girlfriend, later his wife, in Cuba. And it's, there is a series of photographs of the initiation of someone into Palo. They used to be part of the Yale of our library. And this is before even he decided to do his master and his PhD as an undergrad. Um, which is the, good job. He's already doing this work. Yeah. Yeah. But he was, again, he was doing it as a labor of love. It's something he really cared about. It makes a great deal of difference. But I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Kyra Malika Daniels, the scholar who also, she's actually the grandchild of, of, of Bob Thompson. You know, Barbara, Barbara is the son. Uh, Kira is, is, is the grandchild. So, good evening, everyone. Hi, Bobo. Hi, Bobo. Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir, good moon. I am admittedly the winner of this panel, and so I just want to give honor and gratitude and my deep thanks for the invitation to share some of my experiences, absolutely, as you said, Dr. Dawson, as the grandchild of the next generation. Um, I wanted to begin by noting that Dr. Thompson devoted his life to studying Africana philosophies and religions as central to his work in art history. And according to anthropologist J. Lauren Mottori, while it has grown roots in a range of disciplines beyond his own, Thompson is the author of the felicitous coinage of Black Atlantic. You know, today we use the term Black Atlantic very widely, but he was using this term uh, in the early 80s, possibly as early as the 1970s. This is a term that has come to be the kind of as field defining in the study of African and African diaspora traditions. Dr. Thompson's writings reverberate with a pulse and a vibrating spirit, and his lectures are permeated with a certain joie de vivre. As Thompson thoughtfully news himself, quote, if ecstasy is a formal goal of those religions of Africa and the African diaspora, when all enthusiasms seemingly converge and see, you are broken by pleasure and push to the level of the Roi or Orisha or If that's the goal, then how dare one even consider studying these cultures without a modicum of enthusiasm? Those are Thompson's words. And one of the things that we began with, Dr. Dawson, you mentioned that in many botanicas, you were to find certain sacred texts. One of them would be William Bascom's Ifa de the Nation. Another one would be Robert Ferris Thompson's Black Gods and Kings, if not Flash of the Spirit. And very interestingly, some of these texts would go missing mysteriously over and over again as quickly as they were replaced in the Botanicas. Why? Because these texts came to be sacred themselves for devotees, for practitioners of these African religious traditions. His writings became sacred themselves. 
On a personal note, I had the privilege of working with several of his students, including art historian, art historian Marado Martinez Ruiz, anthropologist Ray Gundaker, and several others. And as a student of these scholars, as an emerging scholar of Africana sacred arts myself, I so appreciate his work and I very much enjoy the One whose work I invoke as part of the pantheon of early scholar practitioners in the field. So I'm going to share three very brief things that I find most important. Um, about his contributions. In thinking about Aesthetic of the Cool in particular, which I know is one of the texts that we are invoking this evening, his Art in Motion essay has proven foundational. It was written 50 years ago, and I still teach it with my students because it's one of the few works that I have found that engages so fundamentally with the matter of dance in still art. How do you understand sculpture? How do you understand painting? How do you understand wood carvings? How do you understand stone? How do you understand these still works, tapestries, in the context of motion and movement, in the context of what would become known as performance studies? And I find that this is something that students gravitate towards, something that they understand. And when they're able to see a still work as it was originally designed to be, in motion, it comes alive for them in a different way. I think also Thompson's attention to and devotion to language is extremely impressive. And if you hear, if you have the pleasure and the honor of hearing him speak, you know that he can rattle off proverbs in Yoruba as well as in Kikongo. This is somebody who was serious about learning African languages, serious about learning Caribbean languages, because he understood that certain things could not be translated that Ashe did not translate very well into English. And so that was something that really proved central, I think, in his own contribution. The second thing I wanted to mention is that he really, I think, embodied what we might call deep comparison. You know, today it's very common for people to be drawing from two different traditions of Africa and the African diaspora. At the time in art history and in African studies, there weren't very many people who were interested in doing equally based field research in one site on the continent and one site in the diaspora. And I think that this is really demonstrated in his works like Flash of the Spirit, for instance, like Congo Art of the Sun, when he is examining Congo traditions in the Central African context and also in the diaspora context. He's the first one, I believe, in the 1983 text Flash of the Spirit to demonstrate that Pake Congo so aptly named as a sacred healing bundle in Haiti, are linked to the Minkisi of Kongo traditions. That was a connection that people hadn't yet made. And it was his commitment to studying traditions and sacred art forms on the ground, conducting these research studies in the languages and with translators that really demonstrated this sort of deep comparative connections. Dr. Barbaro mentioned the Sindhi component. He's the first one to note, and I see that, um, Alexander Lasalle has this beautiful portrait of the Congo di Kenga. Robert Ferris Thompson was the first one to say this Congo di Kenga can be seen in the Verde for Sini today. No one was making those types of comparative connections yet. Um, and the last thing that I'll say um, as I'm wrapping up is that his text and his text, plural, we can say, in the aesthetic of cool, is so foundational in the classroom. You know, these generations think that they invent everything, right? Myself included. You think cool is new. You think cool is, you know, just something that we came up with 10 years ago or 10 minutes ago. And to see that he was theorizing about coolness in the 1970s as a deeply black and even deeply African tradition, my students walk away with a whole new appreciation for what it means to be cool headed, for what it means to have a cool gaze portrayed in a sculpture for what it means to embody a sense of coolness in good character, for what it means to embody a sense of coolness in, in the Congo constructs of dance. And I think this theorizing of lived experiences, of lived realities has been foundational, not simply in the field of art history, where he has proven absolutely a trailblazer, but in the field of religious studies. And for those of us, I mean, I know myself when I first read Flash of the Spirit, it was assigned to me by Dr. Martinez Ruiz in my own art classes. I felt, wow, maybe there's a possibility for me to belong to this field of sacred arts, which is combining the fields of religious studies 
of Africana studies and of art history. There is room for me to be a scholar practitioner of my ancestral tradition of Haitian history. So I'll end with a musing by the Reverend Eugene Rivers. Upon learning that I was studying sacred arts in graduate school, he asked whether I was familiar with the work of Robert Ferris Thompson. When I nodded enthusiastically, yes, sharing that flash of the spirit had changed the course of my studies, indeed had changed the course of my life, he thoughtfully mused, oh, that is fantastic. Robert Ferris Thompson is like the sun rock of black studies, just <laughs> cosmic black. I will go. I will go. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. I have two stories to tell you. Don't don't leave yet. Sir. One is um, Bob being modest. One day, you know, you were talking about uh, coining the term um, Black Atlantic. We were talking about that one day. He said, Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that one day. He said, You know, I started reading something about PLA race from the 50s, and he was talking about the Black Atlantic. He said, I must have gotten it from him. I didn't even know it, you know. So. But it's, it's funny, too, because Knowing that I could not get a copy of Lamont, he gave me his copy of, of Lamont's Chicago Dictionary. And every time I think I have come up with an insight, and I go check a word in the Lamont Dictionary, it's already been underlined by Bob. So it's like, I say, oh, God, I'm trapped, I'm trapped. I'm thankful, but I'm trapped. You know, so incredible. But thank you for your presentation. You embodied the impassion that he was talking about. Too. So again, we're going to talk to another child of, of um, uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, Petra uh, Rovola. Petra is, is interesting too because Petra, um, she has a doctorate in art history, but the doctorate in art, art history would only be given by Bob. It's in Roomba. It's in Danny. the National Dance of Cuba. Hello. Hello. Can you John. hear me? Yes, we can, John. I finally got the computer to work to act like it acts. That's some sense. Oh, my. Well, good. Well, look, well, it's been pretty funny because you're next. I know. We had left you out, but, um, but uh, we're about to introduce Petra for that. Okay. John Mitch, <laughs> one of the leading writers on the Yoruba tradition in the Americas and the Yoruba tradition in the world. And a, a scholar from, a uh, homeborn scholar from Brooklyn. Please, John, you may begin. Well, actually, I'm from Harlem, but let's not quibble. <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. Uh, this computer technology. Uh, my daughter came home and helped me get back into the swing of things. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Ah, perfect. Okay, I'm just making sure because I'm thinking maybe the computer is having revenge on me now. Um, after you've known somebody 50 years plus, there are so many things and I sort of took notes because I, I told Danny I said I have I only wrote seven pages taking off on the um, the salute we gave him in African art where I listed the five language areas that he led us all into or gave us a sense of the connectedness of the, all those cultures and what they meant in terms of the Americas and in terms of the work that I do as a priest. And in preparing for this, I sort of took another look at that. And now it's up to eight languages that I've had to sort of train myself in a couple of them so that um, Bambara had to be added to that list. Um, in the mandate grouping. But let's go back. I was listening to, as the presenters gave, and, and the, the word fractals came up. My dear friend who has gone on ahead of us all, and um, he used the word fractals, and he called me one day, and he said, John, John, do you, you know about fractals? And I said, no, I, what, what, what makes it so specifically important? And he said, oh, because everything can either collapse to its essence or expand to fill a room, to fill a space, to fill 
to fill the universe. The cultures that we all study and are part of have that capacity, that elastic capacity. And that capacity is what Bob touched on and gave us a light to look at. The elastic ability of culture, of, of African culture specifically, and of all cultures, to be either very, very small when necessary. It's like making that ball, making sacrifice. My teacher, long before Bob, Chris said, sometimes you only can give an apple to the Orisha, to the Edu, to the ancestors. And the next time when your luck is better, you can give them something more. You give them a complete meal. You can give them flowers. You can, in other words, it can be as small as an apple and as big as a feast. The capacity for divinity, for our cultures, to be that accepting and forgiving that people say, oh, I didn't do something for my anniversary. I celebrated 51 years of being a priest. And people came by, a few people came by, the pandemic sort of slowed that up. And people said, oh, you only, I put just, I put enough food so that when people came, they could take a lot of stuff home. And people said, wow, there's only going to be so many of us, a few, eight of us. And you, get, you, you prepared all this. I said, life's been pretty good to me. And if I can't share it with my friends and family, then who do I share it with? So that this is Bob's message. And it seems like, because it's a fractal message, it's a message of something being small and something being when you have a little, you give a little. When you have a lot, you give a lot. I knew a friend, Leon Sirodo. He taught and worked at the Frisk Museum in Chicago. He was a very noted art historian. And I remember we became good friends. He lived in Queens. And we met through another friend, Morton Sanders. And one day, we started, the subject of Bob Thompson came up. And he said, wow, it seems like he's all over the map. And I said, wow, is that a bad thing? I, I'm not, a, I wasn't, an, I'm not then, I'm not now, and I'm, I wasn't then an art historian, so I didn't know what the parameters were. But it began as a slight critique that he wasn't specific. He wasn't a, he didn't stay in the Congo. He didn't stay in this area. He should have stayed here. He's all over the map. Later, Leon admitted to me what a wonderful journey Bob was taking us all along. And even though I didn't agree with him at the, at the initial point in terms of the critiquing part, because this, you know, art his, his history was sort of, like many other disciplines, I guess, in those years, we're talking almost 50 years ago, that everything was compartmentalized. <clears throat> if you're studying the Congo, you don't study the Europe. If you're studying the Europe, you don't study the, the mandate. You don't, you don't talk about Cuba. You don't talk about any of that. You stayed in your lane. Bob took the long trip across country, so to speak. And for that, he'll always be my leader, my friend in that, because he sent me on the journey. And the journey, one of the presenters said, classical culture. Oh, I'm sorry, I left out the person who told me about practice. It was no for Gray, the very famous drummer. And my dear friend, for many, many, I, I studied with him. And people didn't even know we knew each other. 
we received a, an award and people they were worried that I was going to be the low man on the totem pole. They said, Milford, do you know John Mason? And when we saw each other, we were hugging and, and, and not kissing, but hugging because we hadn't seen each other in quite some time. But he was raving about practice and about how everything can expand and contract. But the classical nature of our country is one of the things that I want to be very clear to me and for, I, I assume, everybody here. That I remember when I wrote Orin Orisha, I opened the book with the idea that Orisha music, Yoruba music, is classical music. Congo culture is classic. All these cultures are classic. They, nobody knows exactly how old they are. And in that classical character, it sets the mold for how we're supposed to act. All constructs come out of that. The idea of Iwatele, all the words that, that we use come out of this, this deep, deep classical thinking. Thinking that's going on for eons and eons and millennia. Thinking about what it is to be human, what it is to live. So that Bob touched all of that. He understood it. And it doesn't matter first, second, third, it matters that he did. And it made his humanity concrete. And hopefully it makes helps make our humanity more concrete. That idea that we come from classical people, that we come from cultures that are classical and continue to be classical, that we are part of that classical heritage. That classical culture created a literature, a writing, so that Insipidi was not the only writing. I, I've talked with Babalao in how many continents? And I've, tra I've trained <laughs> diviners. That classical writing, that classical literature that is generally called fa, depending on where you go. And the Yoruba didn't even invent it. They take a lot of credit for it, but they didn't invent it. My dear friend pointed out that it comes really, it, it can, we can look more to the Igbo, the original inhabitants of Ile Ife, for its germination. That is that product, that writing, that literature is what informs us to this day. And it informs over 200 million people on a daily basis. You can't go to Brazil. I remember dear Maya Stella. And she asked me once, she said, could you read me? And everybody at Afonja circled around because they were like amazed. That she's going to get this. But she was a very gifted diviner herself. But as Socorro, my dear friend and Martha's dear friend told me, she said, every doctor needs a doctor. So that it's in that, that that literature, that writing skill, that, that storehouse of knowledge, of wisdom, is what informs us all. And Bob gives us a glimpse into that as not just art history, but history, period. The art of, of creating that history is maybe the art in the art history. I was, I took a note here. It said Bata in the US. People forget, that's why I put that picture of Bob playing a drum. I have the album upstairs. Bob was a drummer in his army days. And 
we talked about drumming, how he, could be, how he got into drumming, how, all of that. One day, too many days where I was visiting in, in, at Yale, and we ate, went to eat. I tell you, two of us love to eat. So that we went, and he talked about drumming. But this, they mentioned Bata in the U.S. Yes, Julito and Francisco Aguilera were, were early, but they were not even close to the beginning. On my mother's side, remember, my mother was Cuban. My grandfather came from Guanabacoa, and they, he was a tabaquero. He was a tobacco roller. He made fine tobacco to find cig cigars. And this is when Ibo came and opened the factories, and he brought other industries. They, they started out in Key West, and then they ended up going to Tampa, where my mother and all of her family, 13 children, were born there, to my grandfather and grandmother. But people forget there were Cubans there, there were Haitians there that went because of the richness of the tobacco industry. There were people from Jamaica there. The whole Caribbean was in Tampa, but there was also a Yoruba community there, Orisha community there. And that I documented. It's coming. God willing, it's coming. Because I went and I spent time in Tampa, checking on my history, my family's history there. And I have to talk with Ramon Rodriguez from Boys Harbor. He's my cousin, my blood cousin. So we have history to talk about. The point I'm making is that Bob was instrumental in making us all review, look back take record of where we are, who we are, and what the direction is that we should traverse going forward. That's crucial to where we are now, because especially for young people coming up, as I told, I tell my daughter and my, and my younger, well, my younger son and daughter, I tell them, I said, remember, I'm closer to the end than I am to the beginning. I don't plan on leaving anywhere, but, and there's a body of work that I still want to finish. But it's for them to see the connectedness of this. And the, the luck is that we've all moved in orbit around certain stellar bodies. Bob Thompson, Mata Vega, Danny, we can name Henry, we can Roland, Wande, all these stars, these sons that we have been lucky to be in the same orbit with them. That's our luck. That's what Bob has, in my life, has brought forth. Has made me aware of. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tom. That's it. Beautiful. Uh, our next speaker will be, uh, well, I just want people to notice that I've changed my background. The background is when uh, Bob was being um, honored with a portrait put up in Timothy, the White College. The portrait is done by the person in the background, just in a black suit. Bob is all the way on the, on the um, right side. The person next to him in the back is uh, Timmy Knox, who painted the portrait. And the person who made it responsible is Zero Wells, who's in the back in the gray dress. And then there's, but there's that beautiful portrait that hangs now in Tim the White College that celebrates Bob when he was master of Tim the White. But I would not like to introduce our next speaker, our next, or next speaker, our next presenter, our next family member, another another child of Dr. Robert Perry Thompson, Petra Victor Rover. And I said before, Petra it got adopted in art history writing about rumor. Only and only with Bob Thompson would rumor be seen as a visual art. So again, <laughs> Petra Victor Rover, Dr. Victor Rover, please. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I resonate with what Baba Mason 
um, where he was headed with his conversation, with his, with his insight. And I wanted to talk about wisdom. Um, and I wanted to also talk about creativity in scholarship. Um, for me, um, having worked in Africa as a photographer before I studied art history, having worked in the Caribbean as a photographer, I was searching um, for insight and knowledge that would resonate with on-ground reality. And it was the work of Robert Ferris Thompson that did that. Because I was in my early 20s when I first found Flash of the Spirit in front of Hunter College, where I was a student at the time. Um, and I started reading, and things started coming to life. Um, and one of um, my, my own inspirations and, and profound resonances with the work of Robert Ferris Thompson is that the, the, the work itself beyond the content has a spiritual quality to it that reflects the on-ground reality. Um, and I think this is really important. Um, this is an immaterial thing. You know, I find it in the work of, you know, um, writers like Amir Baraka, you know, he's one of my favorites as well, but there is a truth and a spirit that reflects the topic that is there. So um, I was very much interested in figuring out how to make sense of my experiences and go deeper, um, also as a creative, as a photographer, now also I'm a filmmaker. Um, and ultimately though, my interest fundamentally in being an artist and searching for knowledge was to find my own humanity and to really um, get away from the kind of skin deep materialist culture that has emerged quite recently um, um, and happens to be, uh, you know, of Western origin. And, um, and I was searching for ancient wisdom and for truth and this, this resonated in Professor Thompson's work. Um, when I was considering um, studying um, for my doctorate or pursuing a doctorate, the only person I wanted to work with was him. So let me, you know, let me, let me do something crazy and just make that one application to Yale. Thank you to Danny Dawson, who, I thought, Danny, that you actually connected me with, with Professor Thompson, but it was actually another professor that I worked with who told Danny to connect me with Professor Thompson, um, J. Michael Turner, a historian of, of um, Africa that I studied with at, at Hunter. So, um, but that, that was the connection. And so um, in my pursuit of wisdom, I found resonance. And then as I became a scholar myself, I was very much interested in something that was, I think, inherent in, in Thompson's work. And I think it's one of the major clashes too, too, beyond the kind of, you know, African versus Western paradigm. But one of the central clashes is that um, Robert Price Thompson believes in creativity and scholarship. And, and this is something that, that um, um, I think, can inspire uh, young scholars to, to find their voice and not be intimidated um, by some of the tropes of the academy and, and, and to do their best their way and bring to the table what they can. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll show you um, what I mean by that. So for instance, my own work, so a book that I'm working on now, which comes out of my studies um, with Professor Thompson, called Umba, A Philosophy of Motion. Right, so I was always interested fundamentally in philosophy um, and who we are as human beings and how through art um, we can become better, we can become wiser, we can find ourselves, we can transform our energy or our, our minds, our thoughts, our reality. Um, so, but I'll show you how I combine photography with um my scholarly writing, and this is, I know we have a short amount of time. Oh, I can't host disabled participant sharing, so I'm going to share my screen, <laughs> but I can't. 
So, okay. Oh, oh. Technology. So, so, all right, so we can imagine. We can imagine. Um, but you can see my work um, um, on Instagram and on my website. But um, so another thing that I wanted to, to talk about, so we talk about wisdom, talk about creativity. Another thing I wanted to talk about was flash of the spirit, the phrase. And I feel like this is something that I'm learning still what, what that means. Um, um, my latest research is with hip hop street dance culture. And this has been a mind blowing experience for me because many of the same aesthetic principles that I have found in West Africa, in North Africa, in the Caribbean, in the African diaspora, I find in the streets of Brooklyn. Um, and so, you know, the use of bold, et cetera, et cetera. And in my latest film um, that I created, I'm playing with offbeat phrasing, the aesthetics of that, but also bold and shine. And this idea of shine reflecting spirit um, and, and, and um, um, creating beauty. Uh, aesthetically. So um, I had the privilege of working with Professor Thompson for six years and um, his approach was so life oriented and field work oriented. Oh, and I'm in Brooklyn, so we have some soundtrack. All right. <laughs> so his approach, right, so field work oriented. So context oriented. I remember one time I was on my way to Mali and I was asking, well, should I do, you know, should I go to Timbuktu and then do this and do that and connect with the Bambara, but also, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And he's just looking at me and said, well, whatever you can get away with, just go out there and, and do it. And that's the kind of spirit um, that encouraged me. And um, I bring that with me everywhere I go, this sense of curiosity sense of adventure um, and sense of um, connecting and, 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 and traveling and doing as much as you possibly can under the given circumstances. So thank you for having me. Oh, Petra, Petra, thank you. Petra, uh, could you explain something to us? How in the world in our artistic course did you do a, a dissertation on the Say that again. How, how, what? how in the world, in a, a um, program uh, of art history, did you do a doctoral dissertation on Rumba? Oh, it? oh, Danny. Oh, man. Um, there was a lot of skepticism with my doctoral thesis. Um, and I really had to prove that dance could be seen as a form of communication, um, as a form of visual art, and also as a um, um, diasporic kind of center of visual communication where you could establish a literacy. Right? I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I had to I had to demonstrate that and um, it was only right because of the work of, of Professor Thompson, like um, African art in motion. Um, these, you know, just just brilliant, brilliant work um, that anything like that could be done. Thank you, thank you. Our next presenter is, uh, is uh, as I will say, our next um, appreciator is, is, a, is, a, is a grant. Hello. It goes. Um, to what we were talking about this afternoon in terms of Western European scholarship puts things into discipline, and John was talking about that. How yeah. things are categorized and separated when they're really fluid, when they're really fluid. Yeah. We, 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 we were talking about that this morning, and they, they call the uh, Aristotelian, Aristotelian heritage, that whole idea of Aristotle of breaking, breaking knowledge into compartments, you know, which the West still suffers from, you know. And African-based cultures, and most of most Earth-based cultures don't suffer from that, you know. Exactly. So then, what we're looking at is how do you develop that as the way of being, and as the way of learning, and as the way of instituting institutions to pass that on. And generally, within academia, right, that's not going to happen unless you have a person like Thompson or that kind of scholar that sees the world broader 
than discipline. Well, you start your own institution. Uh oh. Right. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Martha. As, as I was about to say, our next um, appreciator is a, is a grand teacher. He has been known to um, uh, do lectures where he dances and plays music, which is a cheap play for the audience, which, as opposed to just getting them your scholarship to play music and then they all get entranced. And actually, you might say nonsense, but they like it anyway because you have them dancing. So I'd like to present to you um, uh, Dr. Henry Jewell, one of the foremost uh, scholars in Yoruba art history and Yoruba art who again entered that world because of love of the arts, because he learned from a great sculptor himself. Dr. Jewell, please. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Martha. Thank you both for inviting me to, to join this wonderful family gathering and celebration of Bob Thompson. And uh, yeah, um, I'm not going to break out into dance, but now that you're showing that photograph of him, let me give my gesture too. Right there. Thank you, thank you, yeah. thank you. Yeah, right there. Um, I'm just going to riff off what I've been listening to. I don't have anything specifically prepared. Um, but but uh, for a long time, I've been singing the praises of Bob Thompson to all of my students and anyone I come across. And one of the key things that keeps coming out today is what's at the very center of his being and our being here today, and that is love. The man exuded love for everyone around him. He gave us permission to be who we wanted to be and hope to be and dream to be. He supported those dreams with his love. Like Barbara says, his generosity of spirit knew no bounds, knew no bounds. And you can say that, that his life was, was a life of lived ashe. Hmm. To, get, to get things done, he, he embodied that and the power of that embodied Ashe reached out to us and touched us and made us the best we could be. The words flash, the words shine, the words spirit, and the words of cool, all of those things are things that we would feel every time we read something that he wrote or listen to him speak in whatever situation that was in, whether one-on-one -on -one in his room in cafe in New Haven, Connecticut, or was it in a, in a huge auditorium where people were going wild at his ability to speak in different voices and to share his wisdom with us. He taught all of us that principle, that central principle in, in all of our, uh, cultural transmission that I learned from Roland, and that is the principle of humility, the ability to listen well, to remember. Too many academics are talking heads, they talk too much, they don't listen enough, they don't know how to ask questions. Bob showed us how to do it, how to listen well, remember, and then share the wisdom that those artists of Africa and the African diaspora shared with the world. Bob's gift to us and to generations to come was his epoch, his sacrifice is offering to the gods and goddesses of Africa and the diaspora. He believed in them. He loved them. He was true to them. His truthfulness, his authenticity, his honesty knew no bounds. And we all felt it. And, we, and, and, it, and it raised us and the conversations that 
we were all a part of. Um, another thing that's been coming up about Bob is how grounded he was. Let me just kind of take that image a little bit further. He was grounded in the wisdom that he learned in listening well. That is, he spoke to the artists who were creating those forms and he took their words of wisdom and shared them with us. He was a mediator of philosophy in that way. Um, he was grounded in other ways as well because he could get down at the Palladium. And he got down in his talks as well by illustrating the moves that had moved him. He was grounded in people. He loved them and he trusted them and he communicated their wisdom. To us. I think his trajectory was something that has shaped something happening. Henry, your your sound is breaking up, Henry. Your sound is going in and out. All right. Okay. Can you hear me now? Perfectly now, yeah. Okay. My hint was, was uh, Black Gods of the Kings when he did this incredible breakdown of the art, of the Yarba arts and the power. take on a journey into new directions. Um, and certainly African art and ocean was one of the things that that uh, really had this chapters in that one that's called Whirling Return of the Ancestors. It was all about the notion of those Egungu ensembles when they creating a piece of blessing for those around them. Bob has given us that breeze of blessing his whole life, and he continues to do it with the work that he has shared with us. The Yoruba have that saying, Aiduru, Ijuni, not standing still is dancing. <laughs> Bob Thompson has never stood still. His ideas keep dancing in our heads. Bob is that special category of individuals in Yoruba culture called Babalao. Babalao are diviners, but the, the term that's referred to them breaks down into Baba, elders. Lao, often translated as secret, father of the secret, but it's not. Those secrets are actually ancient wisdom. Bob is in the category of those Babas who have taught us ancient wisdom. Ancient wisdom that's just as valid today in these classical civilizations, as others have mentioned it. Um, Bob, with his African art in ocean and all of his work, and the fact that he started as a mambo freak, that's how he first introduced himself to me, um, come because of his interest in music and in dance. And it was his life, it is his life, that has given me the permission to call myself not an art historian, but an arts historian. Because you have to look at music, dance, song, gesture, voice, body, emotion, all of those as so-called ephemeral arts that are just as important as the visual arts. Right. 
they're all of a piece, and we have to be sensitive as best we can to all of them. And it's brought me to what I call sensiotics, the study of the importance of the senses and how we as individuals have been created in our sensory experiences on a daily basis and how we as social members of cultures and societies and civilizations are shaped by those sensory experiences. And Bob, to me, epitomizes a person who is sensitive, has incredible sense abilities, and is sensual himself in many ways. It's about his expression of his love that comes out in his writing and his, I mean, his person and led to the book on Tango, Art History of Love. Uh, I just can't wait to see the, the next one coming in Congo. And I think uh, I'd like to uh, have us think seriously about not only establishing uh, a fund in his honor and in his name for future scholars, but working together to make sure that that next book comes out in a timely fashion. And I will leave with these final words from the Yoruba proverb uh, and words of wisdom that Roland gave us uh, at the beginning of this uh, evening. What follows six is much more than seven. <laughs> Bob Thompson has always reminded us that we are on a journey, an endless journey, and that we have to keep asking those questions and listening well. Thanks, Bob, for all you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Henry. I, I wonder, after you, I'm, I'm glad that you introduced that idea because Roland had also spoken about that. I wonder if you could fully introduce the idea we were talking about in terms of continuing the legacy. Roland, could you speak on that? Are you still with us? I, I think. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, so can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, very fitting. I think it's uh, wonderful. It would be wonderful. I hope I would say. Um, of the appreciation of Professor Thompson's uh, work. To, um, uh, to it, it can't, it's really not enough. It's just a token. What is going to be really um, what we should do, uh, all of us, to be better to this is to take the legacy uh, further in all directions and do what we can to make sure that uh, that spirit which uh, moved him um, continues in other people. Now, whatever it is, um, to be nice for um, whatever we can do, contribute to this. Uh, nothing is too small, nothing is too big. Um, as someone said, this. Uh, uh, somebody noted, for is, um, I don't know, it's not a hundred million dollars, I think it's one dollar, is it? Uh, that, uh, but it is a prestigious, um, it's a prestigious award. So, um, there, you know, you know, now the ball is in our court. Thank you. Well, I would like to recommend uh, that we constitute an advisory board to make this happen. We're committed, um, you know, I'm committed, as well as the Creative Justice Initiative is committed uh, to making sure that we develop that scholarship, be it a dollar, be it a hundred. Um, and also, I think the institution of a concept, right, that, um, the breaking up of discipline of our art form is not the way to look forward. And his quote is that flash of the spirit is that fluidity, right? The aesthetic of the pool is that fluidity that 
um, every movement, right? Every thought, um, every knowledge that we put forward, right? Um, is important in terms of how we understand ourselves and understand the brilliance and the intelligence that our people bring through tradition as well as through uh, what we would call formal study, right? Uh, so that uh, the information that the Baba now brings, as well as the information that the scholar, whatever uh, that definition is, brings, is valid. And that um, we institute a way of understanding and a way of seeing and a way of structuring that. So that um, that way of doing research, that way of preserving memory, is acknowledged as the way that it's based in an African study. Excellent. So um, we start that as of today. So we commit at least to $1,000 to make sure that, that there is a scholarship fund and anyone can submit to that. And we are nonprofit, so of course it'll, it'll be uh, designated as that. And um, the next meeting should be to discuss how we frame that way of acknowledging uh, the receipt of that scholarship because it follows through in the thinking that we've all been talking about and the way it's structured. Is that cool? That's cool. Let's all raise our hands. Let's cool. all raise our hands. <laughs> and, and, and this is also for our audience. You can also agree and contribute. So. Uh, Danny, uh -huh. I want to also um, um, mention for viewers and, and listeners who might not uh, know about it, uh, when we, we put together um, a, a posse praise poem for Bob oh, right. Thompson. Uh, it was in the fall issue 2017 of African Arts. And I just want to mention the names of folks who contributed. There were many more who wanted to also send in pieces in honor of Bob, uh, but we had a deadline. And uh, one then, then could I mention something quickly too? Yeah, sure. I just Go also ahead. want to acknowledge that what we have just done here was also done by Brooke Anderson in New Orleans, where a lot of us from the same panel were, were together for that. He did honoring the, the uh, 30th anniversary of Patrick's Spirit. Right. So, exactly. It was an incredible event also. Yeah. And that'll Ricky that uh, Danny and I uh, edited uh, had contributions from Susan Vogel, Brooke Anderson, Roland Atfield-Boom, Donald Cosentino, Jose Bedia, Perkins Foss, Neil Clark, Zeca Ligero, uh, Lowry Stokes Sims, Leslie King Hammond, John Santos, David T. Doris, and John Mason. I did. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Olga, maybe we have a few minutes for uh, comments from the audience. So, Olga, can you help us with that? Because I don't. Uh, know. Yes, sure. Uh, we have. Um, let me see. Um. Uh, we have some comments on the chat, but we also have people with raised hand. Do we have time to allow them to ask questions verbally? Um, I, I wanted it to come through the chat. All right. As I before, because um, people sometimes say things that they shouldn't say. Yep. So I have... Um, um, I have uh, greetings and salutations and ashes and um, and people acknowledging the electric storm that we're having down here in Puerto Rico, which is crazy. And we were we were not sure if we were able to uh, uh, to manage this, but it's, it, it went super well. Um, also, I have a comment. Um, uh from Jesenia, she says uh, bob is like obatala he became an orisha in life for 20 years people talk about him like uh 
the combined bless of um, uh, of brilliance and the idea um uh we have uh, thank yous from uh most of the people from in arroyo thank you henry uh, bob and buddy ashe and made us uh to be in touch with our ashe too gracias um Henry, someone would like you to repeat that volume of, of African art also. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, yes. Um, right. It's African Arts Autumn of 2017. It was celebrating uh, the 50th, 50th anniversary of the publication of African Arts. And it's about elders and ancestors. And we did a, a what we call a, a, a posse praise poem or oriki or Wow. Wonderful. So, well, I think that we're getting close to time. So, let's agree that uh, I'm assigning it. Uh, the, uh, uh, Danny and um, Abil Doom, uh, Roland, uh, might develop what this scholarship would look like. And then we rotate the narrative to everybody to check it off. And then we look at what this looks like in terms of what the scholarship that uh, should be embodied by that person should have. There are also, um, Marta, there's also a couple of organizations that are committing to uh, to what uh, we're talking about uh, among them, the Amistad Research Center and others. Um, so I will translate, uh, transcribe and uh, download and send to everybody. So everybody can, can check it out. I just want to add one one thing. I think we uh, committed to find a way to publish Master Key's uh, latest book. Right. Is uh, I am I am willing to provide a platform and resources to do it if we come together with the uh, yeah, the book, um, the book, the book, book. Yeah, the book is basically completed. You know, we can talk to him and the family about that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm there to help too, my girl. I'm there as well. We, yeah. we could talk to yeah. some of our publishers to see if they would be interested in publishing. Yeah, for those who don't know, we have an audience full of the top uh, curators and art historians all uh, praising the events and praising the proceedings and praising Bob's work. In fact, the Amistad um, uh, Center said they're based in New Orleans. They'd love to be involved in future programs. Wonderful. So absolutely, this will not be the last, but thank you all for saying yes to participating in this because I think that um, a love fest is a stay in motion. So Alex, if you could see us out, thank you all so much. It's a good scene everybody. Hey John, welcome. Thank you all. So beautiful. Blessings, blessings, all. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I don't know if Maida's on. I know she wasn't thank here. You. But thank you to Maida for coming I think, I think she was stormed off for a minute. So. Yeah. Oh, wow. And go through endless amounts of mambos that my godfather would just one after another would sing and, and, um, and, and put out there. So I'm going to start with a prayer, uh, a prayer for strength for Bob and the family. And, and then from there, uh, just go into a few mamas you know, and, and maybe even finish with a bomba real quick. Okay. Mm. okay. And go to Amputo, Kimba, Pumaka, but it's in Ganga, Bako, it's in Shamuka, and Pambo, Silam, Kimbe, it's in Shawanka, Banga, Yere, Kunya, Kunso, Kimano, Kabakona, Kalungira, and the Kuridoki, so in Alemba. Yen, you see Congo, you see Congo, Ilanga Palo, Pakemboa, you see Congo, you see Congo, 
yo ti congo Ilanga palo pa que me lleva yo ti congo Yo ti congo ah yo ti congo Ya barco se viró pa congo no viene más Barco se viró ya congo no viene más Barco se viró ya congo no viene más Barco se viró ya congo no viene más y para lo bien con cuidado de que ciego para lo bien con cuidado de que ciego para lo bien con cuidado this is uh, one of our favorite songs uh, yeah en de curubina de yo en de curubina de yo tu mande llora tu mande llora en de curubina de yo Palo e pali, fuego y ama, rucutu, rucutu, pumba, y a sufrir y a llorar, palo tango mai, denden curubina de yo, denden curubina de yo, denden curubina de yo, tu man de llora, tu man de llora, denden curubina de yo. Reciéntense, no soy cristiano, y el difunto en la sí. tierra no anda a sufrir y a llorar. Todos los hombres, tristeza y perfidio no más. Tenden curubina de yo, tenden curubina de yo. Tu mande llora, tu mande llora, tenden curubina de yo. Okay. Okay. Good night. Oh, thank you. Hey, hey, Bobo. 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 Hey, Bobo.